Act Two of King Lear. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. King Lear by William Shakespeare. Act Two. Scene One. A court within the castle of the Earl of Gloucester. Enter Edmund and Curran, meeting. Save thee, Curran. And you, sir. I have been with your father, and given him notice that the Duke of Cornwall and Regan, his duchess, will be here with him this night. How comes that? Nay, I know not. You have heard of the news abroad. I mean the whispered ones, for they are yet but ear-kissing arguments. Not I. Pray you, what are they? Have you heard of no likely wars toward, twixt the two dukes of Cornwall and Albany? Not a word. You may do, then, in time. Fare you well, sir. Exit. The duke be here to-night? The better. Best. This weaves itself perforce into my business. My father hath set guard to take my brother, and I have one thing of a queasy question which I must act. Briefness and fortune work. Brother, a word. Descend. Brother, I say. Enter Edgar. My father watches. Sir, fly this place. Intelligence is given where you are hid. You have now the good advantage of the night. Have you not spoken against the Duke of Cornwall? He is coming hither, now with the night, in haste, and Regan with him. Have you said nothing upon his party against the Duke of Albany? Advise yourself. I am sure, aunt, not a word. I hear my father coming. Pardon me. In cunning, I must draw my sword upon you. Draw, seem to defend yourself. Now quit you well. Yield! Come before my father. Light! Ho here! Fly, brother! Torches! Torches! So farewell. Exit Edgar. Some blood drawn on me would beget opinion of my more fierce endeavour. I have seen drunkards do more than this in sport. He wounds himself in the arm. Father! Father! Stop! Stop! No help! Enter Gloucester and servants with torches. Now, Edmund, where's the villain? Here stood he in the dark, his sharp sword out, mumbling of wicked charms, conjuring the moon to stand auspicious mistress. But where is he? Look, sir, I bleed. Where is the villain, Edmund? Fled this way, sir, when by no means he could... Pursue him, ho! Go after. Exeunt some servants. By no means what? Persuade me to the murder of your lordship. But that I told him the revenging gods against patricides did all their thunders bend. Spoke with how manifold and strong a bond the child was bound to the father, sir, in fine. Seeing how loathly opposite I stood to his unnatural purpose, in fell motion with his prepared sword, he charges home with my unprovided body, lanced mine arm. But when he saw my best alarmed spirits, bold in the quarrel's right, roused to the encounter, or whether gasted by the noise I made, full suddenly he fled. Let him fly far. Not in this land shall he remain uncaught, and found dispatched. The noble duke, my master, my worthy arch and patron, comes to-night. By his authority I will proclaim it, that he which finds him shall deserve our thanks, bringing the murderous coward to the stake, he that conceals him, death. When I dissuaded him from his intent, and found him pite to do it with cursed speech, I threatened to discover him. He replied, Thou unpossessing bastard! Dost thou think, if I would stand against thee, would the reposal of any trust, virtue, or worth in thee make thy words faith? No. What I should deny, as this I would, I, Though thou didst produce my very character, I'd turn it all to thy suggestion, plot, and damned practice, and thou must make a dullard of the world, if they not thought the profits of my death were very pregnant and potential spurs to make thee seek it. Strong and fastened, villain, 
Would he deny his letter? I never got him. Hark, the duke's trumpets. I know not why he comes. All ports I'll bar. The villain shall not scape. The duke must grant me that. Besides, his picture I will send far and near, that all the kingdom may have due note of him, and of my land, loyal and natural boy, I'll work the means to make thee capable. Enter Cornwall, Regan, and attendants. How now, my noble friend? Since I came hither, which I can call but now, I have heard strange news. If it be true, all vengeance comes too short, which can pursue the offender. How dost, my lord? Oh, madam, my old heart is cracked. It's cracked. What? Did my father's godson seek your life? He whom my father named your Edgar? O oh, lady, lady, shame would have it hid. Was he not companion with the riotous knights that tend upon my father? I know not, madam. It is too bad, too bad. Yes, madam, he was of that consort. No marvel, then, though he were ill-affected, tis they have put him on the old man's death, to have the expense and waste of his revenues. I have this present evening from my sister been well informed of them, and with such cautions that if they come to sojourn at my house, I'll not be there. Nor I assure thee, Regan. Edmund, I hear that you have shown your father a childlike office. "'Twas my duty, sir. "'He did bewray his practice, "'and received this hurt you see, "'striving to apprehend him. "'Is he pursued?' "'Aye, my good lord. "'If he be taken, "'he shall never more be feared of doing harm. "'Make your own purpose, "'how in my strength you please. "'For you, Edmund, "'whose virtue and obedience "'doth this instant so much commend itself, "'you shall be ours.' Natures of such deep trust we shall much need. You we first seize on. I shall serve you, sir, truly, however else. For him I thank your grace. You know not why we came to visit you. Thus out of season, threading dark-eyed night, occasions noble Gloucester of some boys, wherein we must have use of your advice. Our father he hath writ, so hath our sister of differences which I best thought it fit to answer from our home, the several messengers from hence attend dispatch. Our good old friend lay comforts to your bosom, and bestow your needful counsel to our business, which craves the instant use. I serve you, madam. Your graces are right welcome. Exeunt. Flourish. Scene two, before Gloucester's castle. Enter Kent and Oswald severally. Good dawning to thee, friend. Art of this house? Aye. Where may we set our horses? <laughs> In the mire. Prithee, if thou lovest me, tell me. I love thee not. Why then, I care not for thee. If I had thee in Lipsbury, Penfold, I would make thee care for me. Why dost thou use me thus? I know thee not. Fellow, I know thee. What dost thou know me for? A knave, a rascal, an eater of broken meats, a base, proud, shallow, beggarly, three-suited, hundred-pound, filthy, worsted-stocking knave, a lily-livered, action-taking, horsen, glass-gazing, super-serviceable, finical rogue, one trunk inheriting slave, one that wouldst be a bod in a way of good service, and art nothing but the composition of a knave, beggar, coward, pander, and the son and heir of a mongrel bitch, one whom I will beat into clamorous whining, if thou deniest the least syllable of thy addition. Why, what a monstrous fellow art thou, thus to rail on one that's neither known of thee nor knows thee. 
Oh, what a brazen-faced varlet art thou! To deny thou know'st me? Is it two days ago since I beat thee, And tripped up thy heels before the king? Draw, you rogue, for though it be night, Yet the moon shines. I'll make a sop of the moonshine of you. Draw, you horse and cullen, ye barbermonger, draw! Uh, away! I have nothing to do with thee. Draw, you rascal! You come with letters against the king, And take vanity, the puppet's part, Against the royalty of her father. Draw, you rogue, or I'll so carbonado your shanks. Draw, you rascal! Come your ways. Help! Ho! Oh, murder! Help! Strike, you slave. Oswald tries to escape. Stand, rogue, stand. You need slave, strike. He beats him. Help, oh, murder, murder. Enter Edmund, Cornwall, Regan, Gloucester, and servants. How now? What's the matter? Uh, with you, goodman boy, and you please. Come, I'll flesh you. Come on, young master. Weapons, arms. What's the matter here? Keep peace upon your lives. He dies that strikes again. What is the matter? The messengers from our sister and the king. What is your difference? Speak. I am scarce in breath, my lord. Ah, no marvel. You have so bestirred your valour. You cowardly rascal. Nature disclaims in thee. A tailor made thee. Thou art a strange fellow. A tailor make a man? Ay, a tailor, sir. A stone-cutter or a painter could not have made him so ill, though he had been but two hours at the trade. To Oswald. Speak yet. How grew your quarrel? This ancient ruffian, sir, whose life I have spared at suit of his grey beard. Thou horse and zed, thou unnecessary letter. My lord, if you'll give me leave, I will tread this unbolted villain into mortar, and daub the walls of a jake's with him. Spare my grey beard, you wagtail. Peace, sirrah, you beastly knave. Know you no reverence? Yes, sir, but anger hath a privilege. Why art thou angry? That such a knave as this should wear a sword, who wears no honesty. Such smiling rogues as these, like rats, Off bite the holy cords a twain, Which are too entrenched and loose, Smooth every passion that in the natures of their lords rebel, Bring oil to the fire, snow to their colder moods, Renig, affirm, and turn their halcyon beaks with every gale and vary of their masters, Knowing not, like dogs, but following. A plague upon your epileptic visage, Smile you my speeches, as if I were a fool, Goose, and I had you upon Sarum Plain, I drive ye cackling home to Camelot. What? Art thou mad, old fellow? How fell you out? Say that. No contraries hold more antipathy than I and such a knave. Why dost thou call him knave? What is his fault? His countenance likes me not. No more, perchance, does mine, or his, or hers. Sir, tis my preoccupation to be plain. I have seen better faces in my time than stands on any shoulder that I see before me at this instant. This is some fellow, who, having been praised for bluntness, doth affect a saucy roughness, and constrains the garb quite from his nature. He cannot flatter. He, an honest mind and plain, he must speak truth, and they will take it so. If not, he's plain. These kinds of knaves, I know which in this plainness, harbour more craft and more corrupter ends than twenty silly ducking observants that stretch their duties nicely. Sir, in good faith, in sincere verity, under the allowance of your great aspect, whose influence 
like the wreath of radiant fire on flickering Phoebus's front. What meanst by this? To go out of my dialect, which you discommend so much. I know, sir, I am no flatterer. He that beguiled you in a plain accent was a plain knave, which for my part I will not be, though I should win your displeasure to entreat me to it. What was the offence you gave him? I never gave him any. It pleased the king, his master, very late to strike at me upon his misconstruction, when he, compact and flattering his displeasure, tripped me behind, being down, insulted, railed, and put upon him such a deal of man that worthied him, got praises of the king for him attempting who was self-subdued and, in the fleshment of this dread exploit, drew on me here again. None of these rogues and cowards, but Ajax is their fool. Fetch forth the stocks. You stubborn ancient knave, you reverent braggart, we'll teach you. Hmm, sir, I am too old to learn. Call not your stocks for me. I serve the king on whose employment I was sent to you. You shall do small respect, show too bold malice against the grace and person of my master, stocking his messenger. Fetch forth the stocks. As I have life and honour, there shall he sit till noon. Till noon, till night, my lord, and all night too. Why, madam, if I were your father's dog, you should not use me so. Sir, being his knave, I will. This is a fellow of the self-same colour our sister speaks of. Come, bring away the stocks. Stocks brought out. Let me beseech your grace not to do so. His fault is much, and the good king, his master, will check him for it. Your purposed low correction is such as basest and contemptedness wretches for pilferings and most common trespasses are punished with. The king must take it ill that he, so slightly valued in his messenger, should have him thus restrained. I'll answer that. My sister may receive it much more worse, to have a gentleman abused, assaulted for following her affairs, put in his legs. Kent is put in the stocks. Exeunt all but Gloucester and Kent. I am sorry for thee, friend. Tis the Duke's pleasure, whose disposition all the world well knows, will not be rubbed nor stopped. I'll entreat for thee. Pray, do not, sir. I have watched and travelled hard. Some time I shall sleep out. The rest I'll whistle. A good man's fortune may grow out at heels. Give you good morrow. The Duke's to blame in this. T'will be ill taken. Exit. Good king, that must approve the common saw. Thou out of heaven's benediction comest to the warm sun. Approach thou beacon to this under-globe, that by thy comfortable beams I may peruse this letter. Nothing almost sees miracles but misery. I know tis from Cordelia, who hath most fortunately been informed of my obscured course, and shall find time from this enormous state seeking to give losses their remedies, all weary and overwatched. Take vantage, heavy eyes, not to behold this shameful lodging. Fortune, good night. Smile once more. <sighs> Turn thy wheel. Hmm. He sleeps. Scene three, the open country. Enter Edgar. I heard myself proclaimed. 
and, by the happy hollow of a tree, escaped the hunt. No port is free, no place that guard and most unusual vigilance does not attend my taking. While I may scape, I will preserve myself, and am bethought to take the basest and most poorest shape that ever penury in contempt of man brought near to beast. My face I'll grime with filth, blanket my loins, elf all my hair in knots, and with present nakedness outface the winds and persecutions of the sky. The country gives me proof and precedent of bedlam beggars, who with roaring voices strike in their numbed and mortified bare arms, pins, wooden pricks, nails, sprigs of rosemary and with this horrible object from low farms, poor pelting villages, sheepcuts and mills, sometime with lunatic bands, sometime with prayers, enforce their charity. Poor Turley God, poor Tom. That's something yet. Edgar, I nothing am. Exit. Scene 4. Before Gloucester's Castle. Kent is still in the stocks. Enter Lear, the fool, and a gentleman. Tis strange that they should so depart from home and not send back my messenger. As I learned, the night before there was no purpose in them of this remove. Hail to thee, noble master. Ha! Huh. Makes thou this shame thy pastime? Hmm. No, my lord. Ha ha! He wears cruel garters. Horses are tied by the head, dogs and bears by the neck, monkeys by the loins, and men by the legs. When a man is over lusty at legs, then he wears wooden nether stocks. What's he that hath so much thy place mistook to set thee here? It is both he and she, your son and daughter. No. Yes. No, I say. I say, yea. No, no, they would not. I guess they have. By Jupiter, I swear, no. By Juno, I swear, I. They durst not do it. They would not, could not do it. Tis worse than murder to do upon respect such violent outrage. Resolve me with all modest haste. Which way thou mightst deserve, or they impose this usage, coming from us? My lord, when at their home I did commend your highness's letters to them, ere I was risen from the place that showed my duty kneeling, came there a reeking post, stewed in his haste, half breathless, panting forth from Goneril, his mistress salutations delivered letters spite of intermission which presently they read on whose contents they summoned up their many straight took horse commanded me to follow and attend the leisure of their answer gave me cold looks and meeting here the other messenger whose welcome I perceived had poisoned mine, being the very fellow which of late displayed so saucily against your highness, having more man than wit about me, drew. He raised the house with loud and coward cries. Your son and daughter found this trespass worth the shame which here it suffers. Winter's not gone yet, if the wild geese fly that way. Fathers that wear rags do make their children blind, but fathers that bear bags shall see their children kind. Fortune, that errant whore, ne'er turns the key to the poor, but for all this thou shalt have as many dollars for thy daughters as thou canst tell in a year. Oh, how this mother swells up toward my heart! Hysterica, passiot, down thy climbing sorrow, thy elements below. Where is this daughter? With the earl, sir, here within. Follow me not, stay here. Exit. 
made you no more offence but what you speak of? None. How chance the king comes with so small a number? And thou hadst been set in the stocks for that question. Thou hadst well deserved it. <laughs> Why, fool? We'll set thee to school to an ant, to teach thee there's no laboring in the winter. All that follow their noses are led by their eyes, but blind men. And there's not a nose among twenty but can smell him that's stinking. Let go thy hold when a great wheel runs down a hill, lest it break thy neck with following it. But the great one that goes up the hill, let him draw thee after. When a wise man gives thee better counsel, give me mine again. I would have none but knaves follow it, since a fool gives it. That, sir, which serves and seeks for gain, and follows but for form, will pack when it begins to rain, and leave thee in the storm. But I will tarry, the fool will stay, and let the wise man fly. The knave turns fool that runs away, the fool no knave, purdy. Where learned you this, fool? Not in the stocks, fool. Enter Lear and Gloucester. Deny to speak with me. They are sick. They are weary. They have travelled all the night. Mere fetches. The images of revolt and flying off. Pitch me a better answer. My dear lord, you know the fiery quality of the duke, how unremovable and fixed he is in his own course. Vengeance, plague, death, confusion, fiery. What quality? Why, Gloucester, Gloucester, I'll speak with the duke of Cornwall and his wife. Well, my good lord, I have informed them so. Informed them? Dost thou understand me, man? Ay, my good lord. The king would speak with Cornwall. The dear father would with his daughter speak. Commands her service. Are they informed of this? My breath and blood, fiery, the fiery duke. Tell the hot duke that... No, but not yet. Maybe he is not well. Infirmity doth still neglect all office. Where to our health is bound, we are not ourselves. When nature, being oppressed, commands the mind to suffer with the body, I'll forbear, and am fallen out with my more headier will, to take the indisposed and sickly fit for the sound man. Death on my state! Wherefore should he sit here? This act persuades me that this remotion of the duke and her is practice only. Give me my servant forth. Go tell the duke and wife I'd speak with them, now, presently. Bid them come forth and hear me, or at their chamber door I'll beat the drum till it cries sleep to death. I would have all well betwixt you. Exit. Oh, me, my heart, my rising heart, but down. Cry to it, Nuncle, as the cockney did to the eels when she put him in a paste alive. She napped him o' the coxcombs with a stick and cried, Down, wantons, down! Twas her brother that, in pure kindness to his horse, buttered his hay. Enter Cornwall, Regan, Gloucester, and servants. Good morrow to you both. Hail to your grace. Kent is here set at liberty. I am glad to see your highness. Regan, I think you are. I know what reason I have to think so. If thou shouldst not be glad, I would divorce me from thy mother's tomb, sepulchring an adulteress. To Kent. Oh, are you free? Some other time for that. Beloved Regan, thy sister's naught. Oh, Regan, she hath tied sharp toothed and kindness like a vulture. Here! Laying his hand on his heart. I can scarce speak to thee. Thou not believe with how depraved a quality. Oh, Regan! I pray you, sir. Take patience. I have hope you less know how to value her desert than she to scan her duty. Say, how is that? I cannot think my sister in the least would fail her obligation. If so, perchance, she have restrained the riots of your followers. Tis on such ground and to such wholesome end as clears her from all blame. My curse is on her. Oh, sir, you are old. Nature in you stands on the very verge of her confine. You should be ruled and led by some discretion that discerns your state better than you yourself. Therefore I pray you that to our sister you do make return, 
"'Say you have wronged her, sir.' "'Ask her forgiveness. Do you but mark how this becomes the house?' He kneels. "'Dear daughter, I confess that I am old. Age is unnecessary. On my knees I beg that you'll vouchsafe me raiment, bed, and food.' "'Good, sir, no more. These are unsightly tricks. Return you to my sister.' "'Rising. Never, Regan. She hath abated me of half my train, looked black upon me, struck me with her tongue, most serpent-like, upon the very heart. All the stored vengeances of heaven fall on her ingrateful top. Strike her young bones, you taking airs with lameness. Fie, sir, fie! You nimble lightnings, dart your blinding flames into her scornful eyes. Infect her beauty, you fend such fogs, drawn by the powerful sun, to fall and blast her pride. O oh, the blessed gods, so will you wish on me when the rash mood is on. No, Regan, thou shalt never have my curse. Thy tender-hefted nature shall not give thee o'er to harshness. Her eyes are fierce, but thine do comfort and not burn. "'Tis not in thee to grudge my pleasures, to cut off my train, to bandy hasty words, to scant my sizes, and in conclusion to oppose the bolt against my coming in. Thou better know'st the offices of nature, bond of childhood, effects of courtesy, dues of gratitude. Thy half of the kingdom hast thou not forgot, wherein I thee endowed. Good, sir, to the purpose. Who put my man in the stocks? Ta-ta. What trumpet's that? I know it, my sisters. This approves her letter, that she would soon be here. Enter Oswald. Is your lady come? This is a slave whose easy borrowed pride dwells in the fickle grace of her he follows. Out, violet, from my sight. What means your grace? Who stocked my servant, Regan? I have good hope thou didst not know on't. Enter Goneril. Who comes here? Oh, heavens! If you do love old men, if your sweet sway allow obedience, if yourselves are old, make it your cause. Send down and take my part. To Goneril. Art not ashamed to look upon this beard? O oh, Regan, wilt thou take her by the hand? Why not by the hand, sir? How have I offended? All's not offence that indiscretion finds in dotage terms so. Oh, sides, you are too tough. Will you yet help? How came my man in the stocks? I set him there, sir, but his own disorders deserved much less advancement. You? You did? I pray you, father, being weak, seem so, if, till the expiration of your month, you will return in sojourn with my sister, dismissing half your train, come then to me. I am now from home, and out of that provision which shall be needful for your entertainment. Return to her, and fifty men dismissed? No, rather I abjure all ruse, and choose to wage against the enmity of the air, to be a comrade with the wolf and owl. Necessity's sharp pinch, return with her. Why, the hot-blooded France that dowerless took our youngest born, I could as well be brought to knee his throne, and squire-like pension beg, to keep base life afoot. Return with her, Persuade me rather to be slave and sumpter to this detested groom. He points to Oswald. At your choice, sir. I prithee, daughter, do not make me mad. I will not trouble thee, my child. Farewell. We'll no more meet, no more see one another. But yet thou art my flesh, my blood, my daughter. Or rather a disease that in my flesh, which I must needs call mine, thou art a boil. A plague saw, an embossed carbuncle in my corrupted blood. But I'll not chide thee, let shame come when it will. I do not call it, I do not bid the thunder-bearer shoot, nor tell tales of thee to high judging Jove. Mend when thou canst, be better at thy leisure. I can be patient, I can stay with Regan, I and my hundred knights. Not altogether so. I look not for you yet nor am provided for your fit welcome. Give ear, sir, to my sister, for those that mingle reason with your passion must be content to think you old, and so, but she knows what she does. Is this well spoken? I dare avouch it, sir, what fifty followers. Is it not well? What should you need of more? 
Ye were so many, sith that both charge and danger speak against so great a number. How in one house should many people under due commands hold amity? Tis odd, almost impossible. Why might not you, my lord, receive attendance from those that she calls servants, or from mine? Why not, my lord? If then they chance to slack you, we would control them. If you will come to me, for now I spy a danger. I entreat you to bring but five and twenty. To no more will I give place or notice. I gave you all. And in good time you gave it. Made you my guardians, my depositories, but kept a reservation to be followed with such a number. What, must I come to you with five and twenty, Regan? Said you so? And speak it again, my lord, no more with me. Those wicked creatures yet do look well favoured, when others are more wicked, not being the worst, stands in some rank of praise. To Goneril. I'll go with thee. Thy fifty yet doth double five and twenty, and thou art twice her love. Hear me, my lord. What need you five and twenty, ten or five, to follow in a house where twice so many have a command to tend you? What need one? Oh, reason not the need. Our basest beggars are in the poorest thing superfluous. Allow not nature more than nature needs. Man's life is cheap as beasts. Thou art a lady. If only to go warm were gorgeous, why, nature needs not what thou gorgeous wearest, which scarcely keeps thee warm. But for true need, you heavens, give me that patience, patience I need. You see me here, you gods, a poor old man, as full of grief as age, wretched in both. If it be you that stirs these daughters' hearts against their father, fool me not so much to bear it tamely. Touch me with noble anger, and let not woman's weapons, water-drops, stain my man's cheeks. No, you unnatural hags, I will have such revenges on you, both that all the world shall— I will do such things— what they are yet I know not, but they shall be the terrors of the earth. You think I'll weep? No, I'll not weep. I have full cause of weeping, but this heart shall break into a hundred thousand floors, or ere I'll weep. Oh, fool, I shall go mad. Exeunt Lear, Gloucester, Kent, the Fall, and Gentleman. Let us withdraw. It will be a storm. This house is little. The old man and his people cannot be well bestowed. Tis his own blame hath put himself from rest, and must needs taste his folly. For his particular, I'll receive him gladly, but not one follower. So I am purposed. Where is my lord of Gloucester? Followed the old man forth. He is returned. Enter Gloucester. The king is in high rage. Whither is he going? He calls to horse, but will I know not whither. Tis best to give him way. He leads himself. My lord, entreat him by no means to stay. Alack, the night comes on, and the high winds do sorely ruffle, for many miles about there's scarce a bush. O oh, sir, do willful men the injuries that they themselves procure must be their schoolmasters. Shut up your doors. He is attended with a desperate train, and what they may incense him to being apt to have his ear abused. Wisdom bids fear. Shut up your doors, my lord. Tis a wild night. My Regan counsels well. Come out of the storm. Exeunt. End of Act Two.